you so much for your kind remarks, Steve. I want to thank everyone for coming. This is an incredible event, uh, the inaugural um, Asian Conference on Mass Media and Mass Communication. Um, I always pronounce this Media Asia. I didn't see the other A in there, so instead of saying Media Asia, when everybody asks me what I'm, where I'm going, I say Media Asia. Um, but I think it'll work either way. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be here and very honored. <coughs> so I trust that over the next few days we'll become close friends. I'm very interested in the research that you are doing and in the papers that you will deliver. So I hope we can uh, have a chance to chat, if nothing else. I'm going to, instead of changing hats, like Steve mentioned, I change classes. It's one of the problems of getting older, at least in my family, is that I have to wear reading glasses. And I, I could not do bifocals. I, I, I fell down the stairs so many times that uh, I've got to put on two different pair of glasses. Go ahead and see if uh, I can make everything work for me. Growing up on a small farm in central Illinois, I was excited and amazed listening to the stories that my grandfather and father told me about the advent of the airplane, the automobile, the television, and many other inventions and discoveries. Their brave new world ushered in a myriad of advances. I became interested in electronics myself, and I ended up building and repairing many devices from radios to televisions, to guitar amplifiers and tape recorders. I witnessed the change from tube technology to transistors, that's how old I am, um, that were used for amplification. Little devices that I taught in high school, uh, uh, diodes, for example, for switching, resistors to control the amount of electrical flow, and capacitors for storage. I saw these solid state components replace tube technology, and then miniaturized integrated circuits replace the solid state components. With the advent of the computer and the World Wide Web, the world changed forever, and it has changed so incredibly rapidly. But who could have foretold the unbelievable advances in technology that have brought us so quickly to where we are today? Two authors showed us a glimpse of what our world would look like. Aldous Huxley, and I apologize for those of you who are British, and maybe mispronounced, and George Orwell. Huxley's Brave New World, a 1931 novel about London society, is a remarkable piece of writing which prophesizes the futuristic world. Huxley's work has been called a brilliant masterpiece, which predicted extraordinarily prophetic, challenging developments in science and technology. The novel 1984, written in actually 1948, was George Orwell's chilling prophecy about the future where people are controlled by inflicting pain. 1984 presents a startling and haunting vision of the world and established a whole vocabulary of words like Big Brother and Double Think. Social critic and author Neil Postman suggests in his 1985 book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, that while Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us, Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. What Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Postman suggests that Huxley, not Orwell, was right. New Age optimists who believe man's inherent goodness will lead him on an upward journey to spiritual perfection have, in Huxley's words, failed to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions. This all sounds very familiar. Innovation in information technologies has thrust us into an era of democratic media in which almost everyone can have immediate access to news and information and become creators and contributors in the journalistic enterprise. As a result, news now moves in unconventional ways with unpredictable consequences. Not that long ago, 
journalism's transition from analog to digital looked a whole lot simpler. The road ahead appearing the road ahead appearing nearly as straight and narrow, as orderly bites of information traveling down the line one after another. Yet this information superhighway that has held so much promise has been overtaken by a messier thicket of trails, many of which lead nowhere. We now know more than ever before. We are constantly inundated with information, bombarded by facts, data, and news. In this era of text messaging, iPod apps, video via cell phone, blogging, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, MySpace, and other forms of social media and networking, how can we even think? Furthermore, how many people really care that Lindsay Lohan is eating dinner, or that my daughter at NYU is planning to take a shower before going out tonight. Thanks to Facebook and other social media sites, this drivel is prevalent. The trends have sparked considerable debate about journalism's role and key values. The revered profession of journalism finds itself at a rare moment in history, when for the first time, its role as gatekeeper of news is threatened by new technology and competitors and by the audience it serves. Journalism is in the process of redefining itself, adjusting to disruptive forces. At the center of the debate are the critical issues of credibility, ethical values, control, and profitability. Yet these issues have been around for decades. When I worked for NBC News back in the 1980s, there was a time when credibility and breaking the story first were paramount. Those of us who worked for the network were exclusive, and frankly, we looked down upon others. We covered and produced stories often on tight deadline from all over the United States. We told our audiences the who, the what, the when, and the where of the story in about a minute 15 to about a minute 30. But our one half hour daily network newscast left no time to talk about the why of the story. That was left up to news magazine programs and newspapers, and often interesting stories were left uncovered, and stories that should have been updated with new developments were left undone. But recently, news organizations have begun to rely on community members for eyewitness accounts of news that mainstream journalists didn't have time for or missed. Many people have stopped waiting for reporters to show up and are publishing their observations on their own a trend that enterprising news organizations are beginning to pick up on as they incorporate some of that content. Much of this change came as a result of big business. In the case of NBC, it was General Electric that bought out RCA. And they began cutting costs and jobs to the point where it became necessary to rely heavily on the smaller stations called affiliates, freelance cameramen, and even the general public. I was a producer and editor at NBC Nightly News in 1988 when I first witnessed the effects of GE's cost cutting. Overnight, the bureau that I worked for, which had 27 people, producers, cameramen, editors, correspondents, that 27 was reduced to 13. A correspondent from Washington, D.C. was brought in to cover a political story with me, and a field producer who I didn't even know, who was a young kid, was sent to the event site to give an eyewitness account of the rally. He phoned in what he saw, and the correspondent, the reporter, wrote the script and assembled the story with me for air on Nightly News without even attending the event. And that was the first time that had ever happened. Throughout history, access to news and information has been a privilege afforded to the powerful institutions with the authority or the wealth to dominate its distribution. For the past two centuries, an independent press has served as advocate for society and its right to know, an essential role during an era of democratic enlightenment. But now there is an emergence of a so-called fifth estate, bloggers and others whose work usually does not generate the bulk or any of their income and its relationship with the mainstream journalists of the fourth estate. Damien Tambini, a British expert on media law and policy, he rejects the notion of a fourth and fifth estate, 
arguing that there's no real boundary between the internet and the press. But he raises a key question, quote, the current crisis of the business model, and therefore of the fourth estate itself, leads to an uncomfortable question. Can we have media freedom without media power? It feels like a new era has been thrust upon us. An era of enlightened anxiety, as Dale Peskin, co-director of the American <coughs> Press Institute in Reston, Virginia, referred to. All this information and potential knowledge creates worry and concern over harsh truths and puzzling paradoxes. What is the role of the storyteller in these times? How will an informed, connected society help shape? How does the world look when news and information are part of a shared experience? How do the creators and keepers of stories behave when anyone, anyone, can be a journalist, a publisher, or an archivist? What safeguards do we need to put in place to ensure truth and credibility? And what are the implications for our global society? These are just a few of the questions that I hope over the next two days you will have the opportunity to present your research and papers and provide your input and discussion toward answering some of these questions. In September 2003, a think tank organization called NDN, News Directions for News, devoted to innovation in news media, merged with the Media Center at the American Press Institute mentioned already before, that's in Weston. After collaborating for more than 15 years, this partnership has provided perceptive insights about the changes confronting news media and information. This organization commissioned We Media, 64-page report, as a way to begin to understand how ordinary citizens, empowered by digital technologies that connect knowledge throughout the globe, are contributing to and participating in their own truths, their own kind of news. According to Peskin, there are three ways to look at how society is informed. The first is that people are gullible and will read, listen to, or watch just about anything. The second is that most people require an informed intermediary to tell them what is good what is important, what is meaningful. And the third is that people are generally pretty smart. Given the means, they should be able to sort things out for themselves and find their own version of the truth. Today, individuals exert unprecedented power over how and when they access information and with whom they share it. We Media also encompasses the omnipresence of personal media devices.